Aya ma kate. Aya ma. Dear students, uh, kindly mute yourself. Yeah, uh, Vivian, uh, you may unmute. Yeah, <laughs> you can unmute. Okay. Good evening, <laughs> Professor. Yes, how about how's my reception? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So hope you are fine. Fine with the presentation, right? Everything is fine. Yes. Yes, I'm fine. If I start, um I've tried to um my I had somebody look at my computer recently, so hopefully my audio is better. I was having a little bit of problems. So if I start if you start having problems hearing me, let me know. Okay, okay. No, your voice is clear. Everything is clear. Okay. So good yeah, to see okay. you. Yeah. <laughs> Likewise, yeah. Professor. Yes, it's so yeah. good to see you. <laughs> um, so do you want me just to begin or is there any kind of introduction or, or also yeah. are you going to... Okay. And can you share my uh, slides or... Yeah, it's with me. You have already uh, sent me the slide, right? So the slides are with me. So. The PPT is with me, so let me just begin the session formally. Okay. Okay, so good uh, evening, students. So, on uh, behalf of uh, the Department of uh, Criminology, so we have, uh, we are planning to have uh, a uh, lecture series. Which, uh, actually, it is uh, planned to start from uh, the coming Saturday. So since I have got already appointment from Professor Vivian, so she has graciously accepted our invitation to deliver the first lecture for us. So here uh, she's with us. So uh, now I request our head of the department, Dr. Amrita Karayi, to, uh, to facilitate the program, to facilitate her and uh, to start the program. Thank you, Michael. Uh, a warm good evening to everyone gathered here. Uh, with the invoking the blessings of the Almighty and also the blessings from our secretary and uh, principal sir from the Vaishnav College, I deem it my immense pleasure to welcome you all to the special lecture series organized by uh, the Department of Criminology and Police Administration, uh, Vaishnav College, Chennai. Today we have a great opportunity to listen and to learn from one of the most globally renowned criminologists and victimologists. I extend my wholehearted welcome to our eminent speaker for the day, Professor Vivian B. Lord, Emeritus Professor from University of North Carolina, United States of America. Welcome, ma'am. I also welcome my esteemed colleagues, Dr. Michael and Dr. Deepak, who are here uh, with us, and my dear beloved students. So we are all gathered here to learn from uh, renowned speakers, renowned victimologists and criminologists around the world. And uh, it is, it's a great privilege to start off this program with Professor Vivian here. So I hand over the session to our program coordinator, Dr. Michael. And uh, once again, welcome you all. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much. So let me introduce uh, Professor Vivian. Uh, so she is uh, presently serving as a professor emeritus at the University of uh, uh, Charlotte and North Carolina. So she basically uh, she has come from a, a, she is a, uh, she was a law enforcement officer. So from law enforcement officer, shifted her career into academics. And uh, she's a psychologist, so who teaches courses in mediation, interviewing, uh, program evaluation and planning, and police issues and procedures at the graduate and post uh, undergraduate levels. So she also uh, provides expert consulting and testimony in the area of suicide by uh, part of lot of research and source for external funding, primarily focus on policing areas such as police selection and training, suicide by cop, comparative law enforcement systems, 
whole case investigation unit and the criminal justice education units such as education and ethics and retention of transfer students and dr lord is the author of three books uh, like uh, interviewing in criminal justice victims clients witness and suspects challenges for women considering a law enforcement career a guide for preparing and succeeding at the policing and suicide by cop uh, cop suicides by cop inducing the police to shoot and more than uh, she has also published more than 40 journal articles and academic book chapters and technical reports in the area of research so she was a uh, uh, college you know uh, she uh, she worked uh, uh, she is with the college awarded met number of award from the academic criminal justice sciences for their research on ethics education for criminal justice majors majors dr lord also is awarded the us department of justice citizen volunteer service award for her work on this investigation besides uh, she is also a scholar i'm so happy that we all uh, met her when she came to india as a full grade scholar so that is how we all uh, uh, have introduced with vivian so we have been in a, a very good mentor relationship for almost it's a 10 years we are so yeah. both have personally published a paper and we are now working on uh, a police profile during this covid uh, covid lockdown paper as well and she is our mentor and my guide and uh, so she used to support me in all the way whatever the best way and uh, and above all she is a good philanthropist as well so when he when she visited india she is now uh, taking care of her family and she is uh, uh, helping the kids to get educated so both the kids have they have completed their master degree and they are working so that credits uh, goes to her so she is a very good academic cum a practitioner so we are very happy to uh, welcome you vivian so the floor is open so now you can start your session thank you okay thank you um <laughs> So I decided that this would be a good opportunity to present right in the face uh, as a colloquium here about racism in the United States uh, and some of the research behind it. So what I'm going to be talking about, and hopefully you've had a chance to see the slides, is discussion of treatment of children of color. within the US public school system and the juvenile justice system uh attempts by cities such as my city Charlotte North Carolina to address the larger system of inequality that hinders financial opportunities for and the physical health of people of color um the last slide that i gave you provides the sources that i've used for my talk Uh, which includes works by Dr. Susan McCarter, who is a professor of social work at UNC Charlotte, as well as pediatrics um, and uh, some uh, news articles. So first, just to kind of give you some examples uh, that I'm talking about, as, as I'm sure you know, uh, we have a long, long history of racism in the U.S., starting back in the 1600s. and it kind of submerges and then it reemerges and uh we are now going to be addressing it hopefully uh much more openly again with our now new administration under president biden uh, but I'll, i want to get more local first so just to give you some examples a few weeks ago in rochester new york a 9 year old uh girl of color black girl sat handcuffed in the back of a police car distraught and crying for her father as white officers grew increasingly impatient while they were trying to wrangle her into the vehicle one white officer said to this little 9 year old girl this is your last chance otherwise pepper spray is going in your eyeballs less than 90 seconds later the girl had been sprayed in the face by pepper spray and was screaming please wipe my eyes wipe my eyes The reason the police were there was this little 9-year-old had been um observing an argument between her mother and her mother's spouse and the little girl was getting upset. So one of the things that we have in the US is something called crisis intervention officers. They are police officers that are trained with mental health workers. 
And I think that's what the mother was expecting to come and, and help. But instead of crisis intervention officers, the first police officers to arrive treated this nine-year-old who's in the fourth grade like a crime suspect. The police body camera video shows officers at the scene first handcuffing the girl's hands behind her back. Growing increasingly impatient, they try to get in the car and culminating in the pepper spray. At one point in the video, a police officer says, you're acting like a child. And this nine-year-old child says, I am a child. Uh, the, the officers have been suspended pending investigation, but this is just one of several examples um, that I'll mention. And this one, in fact, comes just a few months after a high-profile death of Daniel Prude, a black man undergoing a mental health crisis when his family called the, again, Rochester, and this is New York, by the way, this isn't the South, Rochester, New York police. Officers handcuffed him, then put a hood over his head, and it's called a spit hood because the idea is he was spitting at him, so it was supposed to keep him from spitting on him, but when they he was struggling, they pinned him face down on the ground, and one officer pushed his head to the pavement until he stopped breathing. As the U.S. undergoes this new reckoning of reckoning of police brutality and racial injustice after you may have heard about George Floyd's death last May because that really rippled across the United States, a lot of demonstrations. But this shows the girls, young girls' treatment and in such a way that you know, young, pe young children aren't exempt. Research by Dr. McCarter and others show that black children are often viewed as being older than they actually are and are more likely to be seen as threatening or dangerous. Advocates have long said that the police are treating them in ways they wouldn't ever dream of treating white children. Another example that you may or may not heard about was in Cleveland, uh, Ohio in 2014, where a 12 year old African-American boy, Tamir Rice was killed by a white officer Tamir Rice, this little 12-year-old, was carrying a replica of a toy gun. The officer, the white officer, shot him almost immediately upon arriving at the scene. This officer, along with another officer, were responding to a call of a male who had a gun. Um, the officers were not indicted. A study that was published in the journal Pediatrics in late 2020 found that black children and teenagers, black children and teenagers were six times as likely to die from police gunfire as white children in the U.S. It's analyzed uh, that the police use of force in situation uh, involving young people between the ages of 12 and 17, that black children have really been seen as older, more culpable, less amenable to rehabilitation, and less worthy. This is what, the way they're being seen by officers. So just because of the color of their skin, uh, they are treated differently. And New York isn't the only place where police treatment of black children have been flashpoints. In Denver, Colorado, four black girls aged six to 17 were detained by police at gunpoint after they were wrongly suspected of being in a stolen car last year, last year, this happened last year. One officer tried to handcuff this little six-year-old who was still wearing a little tiara in her hair. It was supposed to be the girl's day out with her relatives. And as he was trying to handcuff this little six-year-old, the cuffs were too big. Another case in North Texas, a white police officer it's recorded on a video pushing a swimsuit clad black girl to the ground at a pool party. Other cases uh, at a school in South Carolina, there was a, a sheriff deputy shown flipping a girl to the floor and dragging her across the classroom after she refused to surrender her cell phone. And, and as we know, these are cases that have been going on year after year. The use of, of, video on folks' phone has helped bring this to light. 
So it, it is harder for police in the U.S. to try to hide or deny or change the facts. In general, the incarceration rate for white youth, which is about 83 per 100,000, 100, is 383 for black youth. Uh, while this is partly due to offending, most of the studies found that teenagers of color are more likely to be arrested, more likely to face severe consequences, and compared to their white peers charged with the same crime. In general, what's found is a quote from Judith Brown Dennis is the way that black children are questioned by adults this underlying assumption that they are not to believe, they aren't to be trusted. And this leads to trauma. It leads to mistrust on the part of black youth towards authority, uh, not exactly officer friendly. So about 7% of US public schools population is suspended annually in the, in the, United, in the United States. Do you have a question? I'm sorry, Professor. Uh, I think okay. it's unmuted uh, accidentally. Oh, okay. Um, about 7% of the U.S. public school population is suspended annually. In other words, 7% of students in the public schools here are suspended annually. Uh, and, of course, studies have shown that suspension, in other words, not allowed to go to school for three to five days, increases these students' likelihood of repeating a grade, dropping out, or coming into contact with our juvenile justice system. Uh, these high numbers, which is about 3 million students, is primarily between the 7th and 12th grade. And a lot of this came about after the increase in our school violence, the shootings in, in, in uh, schools and, and other violence. So there's implementation in our schools now of metal detectors, surveillance cameras, school resource officers, zero tolerance policies, and so forth. Um, and at the same time, they're looking at this achievement gap. Um, and, and those two objectives are in complete opposite to each other. How do you base, if you're looking at ways of trying to uh, keep students safe by these really um, extraordinary means and at the same time expecting them to achieve. Um, it just doesn't work. And, and I'll get into in a, in a little bit how that is not necessary. We don't have to have surveillance cameras and uh, school resource officers. And, and the way we're now going, you may have heard in the U.S. the idea of defunding police and I want to talk about that a little bit. Let me just mention it right now before I get into the school act, uh, the school safe school acts. Most people, when they talk about defunding the police, they're not talking about let's get rid of the police. Instead, in the U.S., our police are expected to do everything. And they're not trained for it. They're expected to be mental health workers. They're expected to be uh, in the schools and involved in discipline there. It's, it's sort of like, because the police are action oriented, uh, let's just let's just put everything on the police. And so, what's finally coming about, which I've been teaching on for years, is the police are there to do a very specific things in the United States. They are there to enforce laws that are on our books, rule of law. And I know you all know that rule of law, same in India, and let them work with and collaborate with individuals in the mental health field and uh, let those that, that understand individuals that have behavioral problems, that have emotional problems, uh, the police just tries to help keep those professionals safe. And it's the same in the schools. What's been happening in our public schools is there's been more violence in the schools, school shootings. A lot of those school shootings came from the outside was to put officers, armed officers, in the schools. And what they have found that it doesn't drop, it doesn't make students feel any safer. So how do we do that? What's happened? We should have more school social workers in the schools. We should have more psychologists in the schools. And the police should not enter the school grounds unless there is a need that means enforcement of laws. 
right now with in North Carolina, which is my state, they passed the Safe School Act in 93, which is when school violence, school shootings started. Um, and that was to anything, any kind of school based offense, which means any kind of offense that occurred on school property. And the, there's 16 acts that were listed underneath that. And these acts, um, although some of them are serious, what they found is that when students were uh, reported on any of these acts, only 3% of them were, were considered serious. The vast majority of school-based offenses were not those that had to be mandatorily reported, but instead they were disrespect, disrespect or insubordination, a fight between a couple of students, disorderly conduct, communicating threat, and petty larceny. So it wasn't serious um, acts that would be considered criminal acts um, by our court system. But in the school, they were considered these more these, these offenses that were considered reportable. Therefore, of course, you're going to have all 3 million students suspended because they happen to be disrespectful or misbehave. Does it mean that we that we allow them to get away with it. No, but there are alternative ways of dealing with it. And I'll, I'll try to get into that a little bit. And what they found is students of color were disproportionately represented in these statistics. According to Odd and Fox, 40% of black students in grades six through 12, 43%, almost half of them experienced suspension. Again, that means three to five, a minimum of three to five days out of school compared to 16% white students, 22% Latino. This gap um, between the white and black students is, is huge. And they control, Autumn Fox said, okay, well, let's see what their offenses were. Let's see what the variables are. And you all are graduate students, so you understand the idea of controlling variables to find out what's really the variance, what really is, why this difference? And what they found is they controlled for 83 variables and they isolated the effects of race on disciplinary action. And they found with all other factors equal, equal offenses, <clears throat> equal age, equal everything, that black students had 31% higher likelihood of this school dis uh, dis discretionary action or suspension. So again, just because in general, that is saying that this would be for those of y'all that, that are in studying your statistics and are in research methods, if you look at something like regression analysis and it had to be a huge study to be able to control for 83 variables, but what they found was they could control all those other variables and black students are 31% higher likelihood. That's highly significant, highly. So what Susan McCarter, Dr. McCarter, who has studied this for years, uh, she has looked at what we call school primary effects of school to prison pipeline, STPP, school to prison pipeline. And what they have found is that they can track students that have had disciplinary problems in the school um, and this direct pipeline, prison pipeline. So what they found is, is that even though only 3% of the reported school disciplinary actions were these serious mandatory reports and were largely reported along rationally and ethnically proportioned levels, the remaining 97% were defiance, disrespect, threats, insubordination, uh, clothing, you know, kids don't wear the right clothes at school, cell phone use, uh, public displays of affection or talking back, that in these cases, 97% of the reported cases were these type of cases. And in those cases, students of color were significantly overrepresented. So that's the first thing was we begin to look at these effects. What causes this school to prison pipeline? Another part of what they found is the consequences don't fit the offenses. Rather than the severity of the crime, okay, if you have a kid in school 
He's brought a knife to school and he's threatening people or actually hurt somebody. Absolutely. That's a criminal offense. But that's not what was happening. Rather than the severity of the crime or even a prior record, you have a child that is continually offending, that those weren't influencing the outcome. Instead, gender, race, disability status, and sexual orientation were more likely to influence the outcome, more likely to cause severity of the punishment. And the way that they know that particularly is that parents and advocate groups are beginning to have lawsuits from across the country. And they've been filed. um, And the public, what they found is the public schools are not meeting their obligations under federal law to administer school discipline without discrimination on basis of race, color, or national origin. Our Department of Justice, U.S. Department of Justice, Civil Rights, says that race with and of itself, uh, of course, cannot be a significant contributing factor. And in fact, that is what's happening now. Um, and, and we are in, trying to change it. And it's like everything. We have to bring it out. We have to have the lawsuits. Uh, we have to be making this all visible and transparent in order to make changes. Um, same thing as far as school discipline uh, disproportionately applied to the most vulnerable groups. Uh, suspension and expulsion clearly has negative effects on students. Um, the exclusionary discipline increases the student's likelihood of becoming involved with the justice system. What they found is that suspended, expelled at least once, a child more than one in seven has subsequent context with our juvenile justice system. And to be clear, in the U.S., when I say the juvenile justice system, it's really the criminal justice system. It's just for children 16 and under, okay? So when I say they had subsequent contact with the juvenile justice system, it's still the criminal justice system. By race, the ratios of those that had subsequent, who had been suspended in subsequent contact was one in five black students, one in six Latino students, and one in 10 in white. A national longitudinal survey of youth data found that one in three boys suspended for 10 plus days were subsequently incarcerated. And now when I talk about incarcerated, that's the adult criminal justice system. So if you look at boys that receive suspension of 10 days or more in the public school, that had the impact of them trying to stay up in school, trying to get back in school and so forth, that they were later incarcerated. It led to their failure, not saying there's not other factors, but it contributed, I should say, contributed to their failure in school. As we look at these the discipline that results that quite often these kids are retained in school, they drop out uh, their involvement in the juvenile justice system. Um, Also we say, okay, well, these kids, so what? Um, First, hopefully you don't say, so what? Every child's life is of extreme value. But even if you want to look at it from the standpoint of the cost to the United States economy, the cost to the schools, the cost to the community, where you're looking at, for instance, in Texas, um, I don't know whether we should use Texas, but anyway, uh, looking at Texas, 60% suspension rate for middle schools in Texas contributed to 13% and their state's dropout rate, which they estimated cost Texas about $1 billion a year. So this is costly. Even if you are somebody in our country that just wants to look at the dollars, you know, they they should be very concerned about this kind of suspension rate. So one of the things, and it's, and it's, I'll try not to get political. Uh, Unfortunately, North Carolina is not as progressive as I would like it to be, but we're pushing hard to try to get more psychologists and social workers into the public schools. I mean, because that's part of the answers, folks, is that if you have 
kids that are in the public school system and they are acting in such a way in school, the more likely there's issues in their neighborhoods, there's issues in their homes, um, and in, in suspending them is not going to be helping them. So the need for more psychologists, more social workers in the public school that understands this intersection of influence, that understands psychological factors, that understands trauma, uh, trauma surrounding as, as far as their physical and mental health, uh, understands cultures, gender identity, sexual orientation, uh, those are all important. Another part that's particularly important as you are graduate students and you are becoming more adept at research methods is where's the data? Um, if you have, and, and this has been a problem with some of the things that I've done in the past when I've looked at mental health and law enforcement and we're talking about them collaborating, but if the law enforcement uses one type of way of collecting data. Mental health uses another form of collecting data. The, the hospitals use another form of collecting data. Then it's very hard to even have a common vocabulary, much less a way to collect data. And that's one thing that is beginning to change. Uh, first is to get a common language. If, if you're talking about an education achievement gap, um, what word can we use uh, that will work to, to describe the phenomena in a more general term? Um, if we're talking about health disparities, how do we use that in a general term across all the disciplines? And then when the data is being shared, uh, we have to be able, how do we code those student conducts and how do we revise that? How do we uh, look at policy changes to reduce the impact of exclusionary discipline. These are all areas that we're working harder at um, at the academic level, at the level you are at, is how do you all as future policymakers, based on your research, based on what you're doing, how do you make a difference in your government policies in the future? Um, and that is what we're particularly working at um, around um, not only not only to know more about the students, but also to educate our teachers that are in the school. Um, we're trying to include continuing education um, type of, of courses for students and re-enrollment. We talk about reintegrating a, an adult from the, our incarceration, from our prison system. But the same thing is true when you suspend a student. How do you reintegrate them? If a student has to be removed from a classroom, um, we're developing more programs where we call them alternative schools, uh, which is kind of a nice name for, but it still is the idea that you keep them in school. You just have them with more resources and um, they have to, they're continuing their study. So then they can come back into their classroom once there's suspension that is very carefully, it's only done when that child for some reason has to be moved from the, the classroom. Um, we have to uh, continue uh, communities nationwide are beginning to implement what we call positive school disciplines. And these positive school disciplines are including social emotional learning, Restorative justice. I, I hope, I know, I think, I know I talked a little bit about restorative justice the decade ago that I was in India, uh, and it's definitely growing. The idea of having children uh, who are the victims, if we want to call them victims, and those, their perpetrators or the person that has hurt them in some way, coming together and talking in a community fashion. So there's really more of a learning process. This is becoming incredibly important. So, you know, along the line, again, of restorative justice, some sort of combination. Um, some communities in Georgia uh, and New York have limited this exclusionary discipline, suspension and so forth, and instead are inducing intensive education setting, more progressive discipline policies, uh, so this is particularly important. Virginia, 
has implemented a TREAT assessment guidelines to simultaneously assess risk and reduce suspension. And what they have found out, you remember I told you those figures at the very beginning, 3 million kids a year suspended. And with these more assessing the risk, reducing suspension, coming up with more progressive ways in Virginia, for instance, with their treatment assessment guidelines, they have found that long-term suspensions have decreased by 19% and short-term suspensions are down 8%. Um, that's huge. And those are, you know, we, we hope to continue to find those. Um, Again, the facilities continue the education and re-enrollment for those that are returning from out of school so, uh, placement, uh, perhaps finding other means to provide them education that they find uh, interesting instead of this punitive disciplinary action that just continues to alienate these students from the school community. Um, so that's sort of where we're going um, at, the, at the school level. Um, I was going to move to um, to sort of some things that our, my city in Charlotte are now doing to attempt to address systemic racism. But uh, perhaps if somebody has a question about the school to prison pipeline uh, that I can attempt to answer, uh, do you want to allow a question at this point or just keep going? Oh, you can keep going, Professor. We can ask at the end. Okay, okay. All right, so um, let me just move on a little bit into what Charlotte is doing. Um, explain me a little bit about my my state. Um, and it's, I'm sure it's true to some degree with every country. Um, quite often, what, North Carolina is called a purple state. Uh, what that means politically is that we're not just Republican and we're not just Democrat, um, and but rather that we have, um, like right now we have a Democratic uh, governor, but our legislature, both the House and the Senate, particularly the Senate, are Republican. So um, I think because of our governor, and I'll probably give away a little bit my uh, my leanings. Um, our governor has done, I think, an excellent job uh, around the pandemic. He's done a better job than a lot of the states. We have had a mask mandate for, gosh, probably half a year or longer. Uh, he really made businesses shut down, uh, and then he's slowly opening them up and so forth. Uh, but our our legislatures have been pushing sort of in the other direction. So that gives you a direct, an idea of this purple state type of thing. Part of the purple state is also dealing with urban versus rural areas. And I don't know if that's true in India or not, but in general, what we're finding is that, that urban areas are more likely to be, um, I, I got to say it, more progressive. Um, they're more likely to be uh the the blue the democrats so for charlotte so the reason i'm giving you that is not to get into politics but rather charlotte raleigh which is our where our capital is um asheville which is another large city uh greensboro which is another large city these areas are um a little more progressive a little more um we are democrat we're more likely to to vote democrat and so we're charlotte is attempting to really look and address this, what we call systemic racism, that don't point your finger at one person or one organization. Instead, look at the criminal justice system, look at the health system, and what is happening there. Uh, we have our mayor is a woman of color. Our district attorney um, is a man of color. They're both African-American. Um, so there is some good visibility for for our citizens. So what Charlotte attempted to do um, recently, and I'll have to explain just a tiny bit more history, they began something called Restorative Justice CLT. CLT is for Charlotte, Restorative Justice Charlotte. 
Um, and through some funding from Stan Greenspan's Center for Peace and Social Justice, they began examining issues of equity and fairness. And one of the things that they were looking for, we have historically um, had a part early in early in our history. Charlotte was segregated. It, there was redlining, is what it's called, going on. So individuals of uh, African Americans had to live in one part of the city, and whites were able to live in another part of the city. And during that time, people of color uh, developed their own. It was called Brooklyn Village and some other areas. They had uh, schools, churches, doctors, um, neighbors watched after each other, the whole social life. Uh, and then like other parts of our history that are tarnished, um, the, they, this part of, of, of um, Charlotte was in what became valuable land. So suddenly, instead of um, just this segregation, they wanted to do, they being the white government, wanted to do urban renewal, which meant they came in and literally came in with plows and told people, you're going to leave and wiped out the Brooklyn Village. So now as we're beginning to look at some of these different areas, um, they are using the idea of surrounding this new development to really look at um, how, how racist some of the systemic racism in Charlotte, even though we are, quote, progressive, because racism, systemic racism is insidious. It, it, it winds itself through things and it's hard to tease it out. So when they began to look at this area that was going to be into, redeveloped where thousands, thousands of black residents were displaced during the 60s through the 80s, uh, they wanted to look over, oh, I just have, a, let's see, this, this particular evisceration. And they did this last summer in 2020. They looked at, they did a lot of listening sessions and community outreach, and they came up with six areas of priority around land, business, criminal justice, mental health, faith, and education. So these six areas, and the city agreed and adopted uh, that in these six areas, that it would adopt a goal first of being number one in the top 50 cities in the U.S. of upward mobility, uh, which is quite a goal because I will tell you that right now, Charlotte, boy, I even hate to say this, but Charlotte is dead last in upward mobility. And so the goal of becoming number one is probably a little far-fetched, but it's, you know, it, it is the idea of recognizing the fact that we have a lot of work to do. So they created a Mecklenburg Investment and Trust for Black Upward Mobility. It's a public-private partnership. Charlotte is a big banking uh, and health uh, city. There's a lot of money here. So a public-private partnership fund to provide access to capital to create restorative measures in this six areas of harm. So the African Americans in Charlotte were harmed, particularly with this uprooting in the area of business, education, mental health, uh, reentry from incarceration, and housing. Uh, so the, the city said they were going to adopt this goal. So they realized that. Um, they also created a community based COVID 19 testing program for all low income uh, Black residents. And also, which was particularly important, and I don't know if India, I haven't heard that India is doing any of this, and this is actually nationwide, but we actually started it, um, our governor started very early. Zero tolerance policy for eviction, utility cable and water cutoffs during the time of the pandemic. So from last, I want to say last May, almost a year ago, and going on still now, a landlord cannot evict, cannot kick out somebody who cannot pay rent 
Um, now, it has to go through a process of showing that that person lost their job or have had illness and so forth. Um, but, and it's not just hanging the landlord out there. The government is more or less saying, we will help the landlord get their rent. Uh, we will help the electrical utility, water, and cable, and so forth, get the money they need um, until this person can get back on their feet, uh, which is huge. That's that's a that's a huge thing. Um, I'm a mediator, and so one of my jobs is a I do this as a volunteer is to work with landlords, tenants, to help move them to 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 that process, so somebody does not get evicted. Uh, they also are advocating a justice system, our, our criminal justice system, that prioritizes restorative justice. Also, another thing is we had what we used to call kind of a pauper's prison. Somebody who, if you have money and you get, you get arrested for something, uh, say driving under the influence, if you have money, when you're arrested, you go and you have, there's a cash bail, you pay your money and you leave until you go to court. Well, you have to have the money to do that. We've eliminated now cash bail. So if somebody who doesn't have a violent background has a stable place, they've been living in the same place, they are let out on their own recognizance. So we have eliminated that cash bail. So poor people who, A, couldn't afford to pay bail, B, if they're left in jail, the job they have, they're likely to lose, is now allowed out um, um, on their own recognizance. They also passed the what's called the ban the box legislation, um, which is in the United States and probably most countries, if you have fill out an application, it will ask you, have you ever been arrested or convicted of a particular crime? They're now banning that and saying that once somebody has served their sentence, um, and I think there's certain felons that may be not part of this, but in general, let's say that you were arrested and put in prison for um, a drug crime, possession of a drug or something. You served your time, you're out, you're clean. You know, the, if you had to check that box that said you were convicted, you would find it very difficult to get a job. So that is legislation that is being passed. Um, they also have expanded legal aid for those that can't afford a need-free services. Uh, they've also increased the uh, African-American racial diversity curriculum in our public schools. So there's more focus on black literature, history, and culture. Um, and they're, they're also working in a number of, of other areas. Now, they've looked at our paper, Charlotte Observer, has looked at how well is the city doing. I, there's other areas that they're, they're looking at also. And this was passed last summer. And it's, um, this report came out in Charlotte Observer in February, so it'd be after about four months. And so they're saying at this particular point, they don't feel like a lot has been done. Um, and I hope the paper will continue to bring that up. Because it's one thing for the, the city government to say, oh, yeah, we're doing this and nothing to happen. Uh, but to continue to be held accountable, I think, is going to be particularly important. The last couple of things I would just like to mention real quick is, so that's our city. Our purple state, North Carolina, uh, our governor, Roy Cooper, who is a Democrat, this last June created a North Carolina task force for racial justice. Um, and that task force is co-chaired by our attorney general and our associate justice uh, judge, Anita Earls. And they have brought together a group of diverse, uh, diverse section of leaders uh, in different areas to look at um, law enforcement management, policing policies and practices, court-based intervention to end discriminatory criminalization, and advancing racial equity in trials and post-conviction. You know, so we can hope that statewide, um, and then 
finally, my last thing I would like to say going nationwide um, that yes, the Republicans, and I'm just, I mean, that's, they're very, I can just say this, the Republicans across our states right now are attempting to pass voter suppression laws. Uh, they don't mind saying the only way Republicans are going to stay in power is if they pass these laws. Um, President Biden signed a voter rights order on March the 7th, which is the anniversary of Bloody Sunday in Selma, Alabama. Um, if you've never heard of that, it's a, go look it up. Um, his executive order expands access to voter registration information, ensures federal employees voter access, and is also analyzing the, the, the order is also to analyze barriers to voting for those with disabilities was keeping them from voting. It also offers registration procedures for military and overseas voters and provides access and education for people in federal prison. Uh, people be, just because they're incarcerated now in some states, but in other states they can still vote. And then also, very importantly, establishes a Native American, our, our Native American voter rights groups. So we will continue to be working in the United States. Uh, we are having people that hopefully that are coming in to leadership that will help us and keep up front where our racism keeps emerging so we can put some, continue with research in this area, which is very important. Uh, the things that you're being trained to do, that our students over here are being trained to do, is all evidence-based. Nothing really should be changed in policies if it's not evidence-based. And that's based on what pe on people like you are learning to do. And with that, I'll end and uh, answer any questions if I can. I hope I was understandable. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for your presentation, Professor. Yeah, 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 it is understandable. So you said like, uh, uh, so there are uh, 3 million uh, uh, children in the U.S. schools are suspended every year, right? So, and, uh, and of which uh, uh, one out of six may end up in a journal justice system, right? So there is suspended children. Uh, so what what is the program the government has to uh, again uh, put them back to school? And Correct. is there any other uh, is there any other program uh, that the government does uh, to reduce the delinquency rate among these suspended uh, children? And is there any evidence that they have committed any sort of uh, property crimes or uh, or some petty offenses? Is there any statistics? Yes, so, so one of the things that we need to be doing is there is a, there's a lot of studies um, sort of state by state um, that show different delinquency uh, prevention programs, programs to um, sort of reintegrate kids back in from either detention schools or just detention from, from public schools. Um, but what is what needs to happen is a more systemic, a systematic, so that it's nationwide. Uh, you know, I think just like India, you have each of your states are unique, and you do a lot of things state by state by state. We do the same thing here, and I think that until we can do more at a national level. And so that we go back to having um, the federal, the government providing grants, more funding, uh, so that it might be in the states, um, but uh, it goes down to the states, but it's federally funded so that we can then study it across the states where we really get a better idea um, of what is, what works. Uh, the, the, uh, school to prison pipeline studies are a good example of where they are funded. There's national funding. Um, and so there is more collaboration. There's more communication across states, across public school systems. Um, and we'll have a better idea of then how do these different programs uh, reduce delinquency, reduce emotional problems. Um, and have better data. I don't know if that's answering 
so so yes, I guess a simple answer is there are a number of really productive, beneficial programs, but we need to be to get them funded at the federal level and study them more across the whole United States. Yeah, understand, Professor. So anybody have any doubt, you can ask now. Ma'am, can I? Please. Hello, ma'am. Yes. Uh, I'm a third year student. My question is that there is a general idea of the people in foreign countries that the black people are more committed towards crime. And are there any steps taken by the government to stop the thought process of the citizens over there? I, I lost part of it. Can you say it again? Repeat your question. Maybe yeah. say it a little slower. Yeah, ma'am. That is in thought process of the people that they think that the more crimes are create, uh, done, committed by the black people. So is there any government measures or steps taken to eradicate this kind of thought process from the citizens? Oh, that's a great question. That is a great question. Um, I'm going to probably give you uh, an expanded answer, if that's okay. So let me know if I answer this. Sure, ma'am. Sure, ma'am. You, you yeah, sure. All, you can take your time. Okay. You, you're aware of, it starts very early that um, people get perceptions, racial prejudice, biases at an early age. And it's not just white privilege and white people that believe what you just said. You know, when I walk down the street and I see a black man coming towards me, I'm going to be more scared than if it was a white man coming at me. It, it's also because it's so, this is that systemic racism in the United States and perhaps other countries, I'm just going to speak for the United States, that even people of color believe that. And that's one of the things, if you go back to our first laws around integration is Brown versus the Board of Education, they did a study with um, young children, four or five years old, and asked them about uh, what they preferred in dolls. And they found that it was so ingrained that what was beautiful in our United States was um, blonde hair, white skin or whatever, that even young black children wanted that doll. And that was so profound that we realized that. So in answering your question, we have a number of different efforts going on. Uh, they're going on in our churches. It's going on in school. It's going on in communities. Um, and it's certainly going on in, uh, in governments all the way up to right now federal government of, of, of programs, but it's more what they're calling dialogues so that we're trying to do more in bringing people that look different from each other uh, together. Now, I will say that unfortunately, what happened with Brown versus the Board of Education, um, the, the, here's my opinion. It was a great thing that happened because <laughs> it actually happened. I'm 67 now. And so this all, I, I went to public school, high school, just as it was integrating. And, and because for our schools across the nation to be integrated, it meant busing students. Okay. And, and there's some, there's some, there's some, um, some bad things about that. Busing, you know, busing from and having to be on a bus for a period of time. But it put it put people that did look different together in the classroom. As they did away with busing, our communities and our schools and so forth sort of drifted apart um, and have have resegregated 
not by force, by um, more of the, the socioeconomic and, and that sort of thing. So what we're trying to do now is things like uh, magnet schools. I don't know, does India have magnet schools? I don't, let, let me just briefly explain. So for instance, in Charlotte, you can, uh, beginning early, you can go and focus more on computer science or um, uh, language immersion programs or um, health sciences. I, I have neighbors next door that have kids and I'm trying to, and these are magnet schools. And so they put the magnet schools, these special, these emphasis in schools that are more likely to be uh, predominantly schools of uh, students of color if they was in a magnet school. So, so if you, so in other words, we have South Charlotte that is a rich part of Charlotte, almost all white faces. There's not any magnet schools there. <laughs> what they've done is they've tried to put most of the magnet schools in, in our more of our inner cities. Um, we have some out in our area where I live now. I live in a pretty diverse neighborhood. Um, and so that we, they, they are trying to attract students. So there'll be a mix of students based on their interest, area of interest to study. And quite frankly, their parents' interests or what they want them to study. Um, and so that the mixing happens more naturally. So, so to answer your question, you, it's hard to get people to change their viewpoint once they get old like me. Even when they get as old as your professors, you know? Uh, sorry, Michael. Sorry, Anne Ruth. I know you guys are young, but anyway. Um, but but you got to start them um, like the musical South Pacific. <laughs> you know, prejudice starts very early. So the more we can get uh, people together at an early age, but then also consider continuing these dialogues, and that's what these special programs are. So the magnet school programs in the schools, um, our churches are doing a better job. I'm a Unitarian, and the Unitarians are really working to collaborate across um, our wise, um, our very diverse, uh, our sports. I mean, that's the one thing. If you look across our sports, on the field, <laughs> if you're a football player, if you're a basketball player, if you're a soccer player, our football, um, is, is, is we call it soccer, you know, places like this is where some of this can change. Um, and then we just have to continue to keep it going forward and see ways to do it in constructive ways. Um, at the top, if you look at what President Biden's doing, if you've looked at his cabinet positions, putting uh, the first time a Pueblo, um, an, an Indian, uh, our, our Secretary of Interior um, is, um, is, is part of, is a Native American. Um, our, hey, our vice president is one of your own. You know, it's all of these sorts of things that are going to help change people's perception. Not all people, but can continue to change over the, the decades. That's, that's our hope. That's what we're trying for. I hope that answered your question. Yes, Professor. Thank you, Mama. Anybody, anybody have any question to ask? Sir, I have a question, sir. Yes, Gautam. Yeah, good morning, good madam. I am Gautam from third year, madam. Uh, I have a question that uh, uh, recently the American uh, murder rate is uh, spiking. But, uh, the data collected by FBI is based on a hierarchy rule like uh, system at the uh, regulatory system. I don't know, madam, that term. And uh, that uh, system consists of only the serious crimes, madam, and uh, including that serious crime that uh, some crimes like uh, kidnapping and uh, some other things na is not uh, recorded, madam. And uh, what is the reason for that, madam? And uh, one more thing, madam. Uh, recently, during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, madam, uh, uh, the students who are from uh, Asia and uh, Asian countries, madam, they face it like uh, verbal abuse and uh, physical abuse. Basically, like 68% uh, of fa faced like uh, verbal abuse and 11% faced uh, uh, physical abuse, madam. Uh, and uh, what is uh, what is the compensation if uh, if the government can give for them, madam? Uh, 
if they are uh, verbally abused because uh, your person emotion cannot be changed if they are uh, affected emotionally madam so what is the compensation highest compensation the us government can give me? I, I as part of, I'm sorry guys and part of your uh, you were breaking up a little bit and um, I have really old ears and sometimes I have difficulties um, with with uh, the dialect oh, changes this question is uh, yeah Vivian can you hear me yeah yeah yes hello yeah can you hear me yeah Vivian, uh, can you hear me yeah he j yeah, yeah, yeah. He is asking a question that uh, why the murder rate in US is high, number one. The what? And the what rate? Wait, wait. I'm sorry. The, the what rate? Homicide. Yeah, homicide. Oh, the homicide, homicide rate, rate is. Rate. Yeah. yeah. The homicide rate is high in US, uh, comparatively other crimes. And a second question is uh, uh, during this pandemic period, uh, so many uh, uh, non-Americans like Indians and other countries. So there are some reports they stated that uh, almost 70 percentage of these people have faced any form of verbal abuse. So what is the compensation for such abuses uh, the government is providing? So that is a question he asked. OK, uh, let me answer the first question, then I may have to ask the second question again. I'm not entirely clear so just so <laughs> why is our homicide rate so high um i there's a couple of really good articles and if if you'd like to know more about that i'll be i'll be glad to send them through um uh maybe dr michael he, here it is <laughs> in a nutshell we have zero almost zero uh gun control and our answer by so many people in the united states to gun violence is to arm more people don't ask me to explain the logic of that because as you can probably tell by my tone of voice that i think it is ludicrous now i will say um so so i'll, I'll, I'll expand that slightly but then also i will say that uh, I noticed that it just hit our papers is that the um, the House, our House, House of Representatives, is bringing up a gun control uh, bill again, but hopefully it has a better chance of passing. Uh, oh boy, and I could get really, I, and I really don't want to get political with this, but I mean, we have so little gun control that. Um, it's very difficult to know who has guns in the United States. Um, there is no control on how many guns you can get. Um, it is easier for a 12 year old to buy a long gun, a rifle, a shotgun in the United States than it is a beer. Um, so, so that to me, is if you look at the comparison of how many guns are in the United States versus other country, at least one factor, there are other factors, um, but one factor is just how many guns we have. Um, I will say that along with those guns is our continuation of a Wild West culture. You know, you diss me, quote, you disrespect me, uh, then my response is to hurt you, to kill you. Now, um, I will mention somebody had asked about some of the um, programs, a really uh, useful program in schools, and I hope they are, um, it's not my area of research, so I don't know, but I'm, I, it wouldn't be hard to find out. I hope they are, I know they're funding it, so there should be national research on this is in the schools having peer uh, discussions, you know, in other words, kids of the same age and so forth, having discussions about how to do conflict resolution, how to de-escalate violence without weapons. So, so we can hope slowly we can reduce uh, this culture that we have in the United States of what we call the Wild West culture. Uh, but uh, I don't, so hopefully that answers your question to some degree. Um, yeah. I mean, it's horrible in Charlotte. Charlotte's the homicide 
Uh, we had three murders just this last weekend. I don't know where we are right now, but um, it's it's pretty bad. And then what was the second question? Tell uh, me again. Question, yeah, the second question is, uh, what are the different types of compensation is being awarded to the victims of verbal abuse? And those victims are from uh, non-Americans, non-natives. So, so during so, this COVID uh, nineteen, uh, this COVID pandemic lockdown period, so he mentioned that in a report, uh, uh, so many of the non-Americans were uh, subjected to various forms of abuse and exploitations, of which almost seventy percent of the abuses were verbal abuses. So, in those cases, what are the type of compensation was given to the victims? Yeah. So, so that um, is the second uh, question. Yeah, I mean, I think so. Let me let me tease that question apart a little bit. I'll give you an example, um, and you know the examples. But just to make sure we're on the same page, I think it was just yesterday that, and and this intertwines what you just mentioned about our homicide rate. There was a an individual, and they've arrested him, who went into a um, salon hair like a hair salon, and and shot eight Asians. You know, in the past, individuals, um, and I'm assuming they were Asian um, in the sense of, um, they just said that what I heard was Asian. I'm assuming it was probably like Far East, Vietnamese, Chinese, and so forth. Now, during 9-11, it was the Middle Eastern cultures that were harassed in the United States, right? It's like whatever is going on, but as you probably remember, President Trump called this the China flu, I think is what his term was. So he was clearly pointing his finger at trying to blame the pandemic on, on a, a, a race of people, right? So, so you're right. We, we have, you know, can we point our fingers at people that don't look like our, our white, uh, quickly becoming minority in the United States? Uh, but, but so, yes, yeah. so what we have first is we have hate crime laws. Uh, and once something can be identified as a hate crime, then it becomes a federal crime. Um, and there's a whole different uh, level of an investigations and seriousness. Sorry. I can't turn that off. It's um, the landline. Okay. Um, so, so it once it becomes a hate crime, then it becomes at a, a whole different level of seriousness, investigation, resources, and that sort of thing. So, when you if you're saying as far as compensation, now that is from the uh, law enforcement enforcement side, victims. It depends on exactly what um, what the abuse is, and, and 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 I probably would have to think about how you're defining that. But we do have, uh, and I remember when I was in India, I don't, I think you were just trying to get some victim compensation bills passed at that time. Uh, we do have victim compensation uh, laws, so if our victims um, are hurt. Uh, they have both criminal and civil uh, paths. Um, if if the individual is is hurt or their family is hurt, then um, there is criminal where where the victim is compensated first. So that if an individual let's say let's say that an individual uh, burns down somebody's house. And that and it's identified as a as a racial crime, and and that happens. I, I can think of some different cases. There was one even in Chapel Hill, which is not too is in North Carolina. The victims, the fact that their house was destroyed, um, they will compensate from that perpetrator first before anybody else, and that is becomes part of the punishment. They also, we have a strong civil uh, set of, of laws, of courts, 
and 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 quite often that's where they do the cases i was talking about as far as in the school and that sort of thing those go through civil court um and i know i did some mediations i, I i'm a mediator in both superior court family financial and district court and i've been involved in some cases in which there there was uh, the racial undertone um, it was two people that began as sort of a verbal fight. Some things were said, uh, and then it went on from there. But it was a civil suit. So the person that was the victim that was being verbally abused was suing the other party for the distress and other, some other damage that occurred. So we, we have both criminal... Uh, victim compensation and civil courts that they can, and the, of course, our civil court has a lower level of of um, probability that has to be measured. Does that does that answer your questions? Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Vivian. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, Vivian. Okay. Anything else? Thank you so much, Professor. I have a question, if I may. Uh, and I believe uh, this goes back to uh, your presentation. So how do you think this uh, change in learning environment, because most of the schools have gone to online platform learning, and how do you think that uh, would uh, reflect in you know, what, what the, uh, everything that we've been talking about today in your presentation? Oh, man, there's been so much about that. Um, the... <sighs> There's so much disparity with online, as, as, and, and I know I, this is not a criticism of our teachers, um, but there's not been proper resources given to the school. Our school systems are county. Um, so, you know, and, then, and we have states and then we have counties within our states and school systems are resourced primarily by the counties. Um, they have asked, they asked for more resources, did not get them in most cases to provide, to try to provide more resources. I think our, our students overall, almost 100% would get, for instance, perhaps uh, uh, a Kindle or some a sort of something if they didn't have it, but they wouldn't have internet for instance, even in some places where kids were having to go just to get internet was just, just appalling. Plus, as far as just having the resources that usually the kids that are already behind are going to be the ones. So there's, there's already been numerous studies of the kids just getting, and the testing, when they did end-of-year testing, um, the, the children that are just uh, really doing poorly. I know in North Carolina, they're talking about summer school. So again, you're going to have kids with least resources now being in the summer, which is an answer. But again, it just shows a disparity between those and those that have not. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's really it's really hard. And so in some ways, I understand the push to get the kids to school. Um, another thing we started through the buses um, before that was shut down. Um, what was happening for refugees in Charlotte, we continued to try to help because a lot of the kids that were refugees where they were getting their breakfast and lunches were at school. Um, so, you know, a hungry child's not going to learn. Parents are going to have trouble helping them. So, again, trying to find nonprofits uh, and other advocate groups to try to help kids get fed uh try to learn um it, it's it's going to be it's going to be a mess when the kids come back and and our, most of the kids are now coming back to school sort of in the middle of the year um and i i i'm so i feel so sorry for the teachers i, I know it's going to be hard because the kids are really behind does that answer your question yes professor thank you ma'am yes guys last question Last question, only one question. Yeah, please ask. Hi, ma'am. Yeah, please ask. Ma'am, as you said yes. before, the rate of juvenile delinquency and school dropouts are high in the United States. According to you, what may be the major factor or cause for juvenile delinquency 
can you explain how children in conflict with law are treated by your government in observation homes and what are the various rehabilitation process implemented by your government to change those children ma'am okay got the first part when you talked about uh juvenile delinquency and and the student to prison pipeline the the, the issues around that then so ask your question again according to you what may be the major cause for juvenile delinquency ma'am the major cause okay <laughs> the major cause i juvenile delinquency is not my area although i think if it were i think that i would probably say there is not one cause but i'm going to i'm going to answer you anyway i think if we could provide equity across resources to our children beginning at an early age we would reduce vastly juvenile delinquency so what i'm talking about is for instance they have found that children who begin in nurseries, uh, preschools, curriculum, and other words that they actually are learning beginning at a very early age, that at least what they find is that those students are then vastly prepared uh, in comparison to control groups of the same social economic status. Now, granted if you keep tracking those kids that begins to fade but if you have four-year-olds that enter enter kindergarten and first grade as prepared as the more well-off students in the class then they will continue to experience success which will lead to more success while if you have a three or four-year-old who receives nothing and then enters kindergarten and first grade and experiences failure, then they will continue to expect that they're gonna experience failure. So even though they've, there's studies that say, well, you know, does that affect last, have long lasting effects, 10 years? When you look at the whole area of labeling, the labeling theories, which I would imagine you're still teaching is, if you're labeled as stupid, when you're four, it's hard to erase that. So I think that for us, a huge part, and there are certainly a lot of work that is attempting to do at the federal level is funding preschools to get make sure that all kids starting at about the age of three or four are in quality, not just sit in front of a TV, but quality preschool that starts their ability to socialize, to read, and to appreciate reading and so forth. I think that would be a huge factor in reducing delinquency in the United States. Yeah. Thank you, Vivian. Sure. Thank you so much. <laughs> so now I uh, request uh, Dr. Weaver Casey to propose the word of thanks. Okay, so are we? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Am I audible? Yes. Yes, you are audible. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Vivian. I know it's been a long time since I heard from you. I don't know how many years. Uh, to answer that question you asked uh, in the middle, you were you were very clear. And I believe all of you, all of us, uh, got a lot of information, and all of us enriched our perspective about the issue of uh, racial profiling, if, if I can say so, uh, in the U.S. And I'm quite sure uh, our students uh, had numerous applications for the lecture which you delivered 
uh, right now on subjects such as uh, human rights uh, penology uh, police administration and uh, other subjects social problems there is another subjects so we deal with these aspects uh, the indian version of these aspects uh, in our classes so uh, uh, i believe uh, this would be very useful for them and uh, since it is customary for me to you know summarize uh so yeah, how our students can look at uh, the the lecture and get benefited is like uh, to compare uh, our system of uh, racial profiling so, um, in in you have a very clear uh, color coded system of uh, racial profiling we have a system created with uh, so far this is uh, uh a kind of profiling based on religion you know people discriminate on the basis of religion and then they we have caste system here discriminated on the basis of caste and then we have uh then there is the money factor and also there is also some uh, amount of color system like uh, uh you know slightly fair person discriminating slightly darker person like that we have different kind of complex system of uh, profiling here uh, in that aspect so on behalf of the department of criminology and uh, the dg vishnu college i would like to express our immense thank uh, to professor uh, vivian b lords for agreeing to talk to us and to have delivered a wonderful lecture for our students thank you so much and i would like to express sincere thanks to our secretary principal for giving us an opportunity to conduct this program then our beloved hod uh, a constant inspiration for us dr amrita karayil and the coordinator of the program dr michael elvalan and our beloved students who are the backbone of our department thank you so much to everyone i believe that concludes uh, our webinar here today professor yes. so thank you once again uh, from our yes. end it was a pleasure interacting with you and to see our students interact with you as well thank you <laughs> thank you professor yeah. <laughs> thank you so much thank you so much vivian yeah Thanks You're welcome. Bye. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Alright, students. Uh, I think you would have received the uh, the attendance link. So kindly fill the attendance link and uh, submit uh, once the lecture gets over. So thank you so much, guys. I think it is a very uh, uh, long day for all of you. So we had class in the language classes in the morning, and uh, we have we also had some classes in between, and we have attended this class. So thank you so much for those who. Uh, uh at the today's class so thank you so much so we'll see you again thank you thank you sir so if we can leave yeah thank you sir 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 thank you ma'am thank you sir thank you so much thank you so much thank you so much thank you so much